Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, measures to make owning a home more affordable, ending child marriage in Minnesota, legalizing sports betting, and allowing college athletes to earn money for their talent. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Senate Republicans recently announced a series of measures geared towards making homes more affordable and accessible. One of the misconceptions uh, that builders get is that we only want to build these bigger homes for people, um, that that's where we make our money and that's, you know, that's all builders want. They want to build these bigger homes and that's not the case. I think we'd all be surprised at just how willing buyers would be to purchase a simple, well-built home. Uh, but today our requirements, our zoning rules, our land costs, lot sizes, park fees, engineering requirements, they just don't allow for the simplicity we used to take for granted. I can see across the board the regulations have increased the cost of remodeling for permitting, electrical plumbing, heating, all the way across the board for everything that we're putting in. As we uh, visit with our builders, we understand the high percentage of, of total costs that rules and regulations has become. We all understand we can't get rid of every rule and regulation. There is a need for that out there uh, for, to ensure the safety uh, of the consumer. Uh, but at the end of the day, we also need to make sure that we, our consumers, are not paying additional money uh, just in order to uh, uh, to help uh, local budgets out and and uh, have them pick up a unfair share of that particular burden. In practicality, it is illegal to build a starter home anymore. And what we're trying to say is we need pockets of the city that have places where we can build affordable homes. We're not saying throughout the whole city, but there has to be a portion of the city that can have a higher density and, and a lower price point home. Senator Rich Dreheim, chair of the Select Committee on Home Ownership Affordability, now joins me in the studio. Thanks for being here. Well, thanks for having me. In a recent Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine article on affordable housing, an executive with Housing First Minnesota likened the housing market to automobiles, saying that we have way too many BMWs and not enough Toyota Corollas. Is this a good analogy? I, I think it's an excellent analogy and, and uh, you know, a lot of things that we're doing as a state and, and local communities uh, push the BMW more so than the, the lower end vehicle or house. So, so the, the way that the state is currently set up right now is encouraging more high-end development and not enough affordable development. Is that yeah, kind of what you're saying? I, I would agree with that. I think we've changed how we kind of do zoning in, in a lot of communities um, and what the requirements are. And, and I think we've uh, kind of pushed out the what we would refer to a high density housing in most communities. You and members of your caucus rolled out a package of bills last week to try to increase the number of affordable homes. And in affordable homes, we're talking, I believe, about houses between two hundred and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, roughly. Uh, let's start with code changes. How much savings can be found here, and what kinds of changes can be made? You know, when we Part of the whole discussion is for every thousand dollars we add to the cost of a home, we eliminate between three and four thousand people being able to afford that home. And that might not sound like much, but you start talking about code changes, inspection fees, uh, permitting fees, um, it, it, it adds up. The new proposal for building code this year would add about two thousand dollars to just the electrical code. So, so anything new being built would have an additional two thousand mm -hmm. dollars in meeting electrical code. Correct. And then, uh, one one of the proposals we have is to eliminate eliminate window clips on windows for single family homes. You can still put them on if you decide in your house if that's the right thing for you and your family. Um, but th th we were touring. We've toured a whole bunch of different building sites throughout the whole state, yeah, both profit and nonprofit, and that's something we can talk about too. But we were in a new home and they had window clips. And window clips are when you open a window, they only open so far, so kids can't fall out of the window. Um, and you had to push in on either side of the window to get the window clip to go beyond that, I think it's eight inch gap. Well, the adult couldn't open it. So two adults tried and they could not open it. Um, that's how difficult it was to open. So 
we believe that we could eliminate this and that would save $800 to $1,000 on the cost of a new home. Now, if someone wants it, they can sure add it to their home. And, you know, it's a different issue for apartment buildings or, or tall structures. But for single family homes, we don't think it's needed. I think it's an added expense and, and we could save that. And so this is just one example of some of the things that have become required that maybe should be optional. Correct. Yep. It was pointed out in your committee and also in the press conference that building permit fees has, have, are significantly lower in our neighboring states than here in Minnesota. How are the fees set and what can be done here in the state to make sure that the permit fees um, are not higher than they need to be? Well, we already have a, a state law that says that you can only charge as much as it costs. So the local community, whatever city X, if you live in city X, um, you know, they're supposed to charge what it costs them for the, for the permits and uh, um, for inspections and permitting and stuff. But the um, dollar amount that we're hearing, and I got letters from all over the state from people talking about how expensive their building permit was. Um, I had one that was $25,000 for building permits. And we're saying, we understand the city needs to charge something, but we think we've gotten too expensive for the building permits. Um, one community um, real close to my district charges about $17,700 for their average home. And, and we think that's too much. We don't think it's necessary to charge that much. And then so will these cities then have to justify why they're charging what they're doing? Or what's going to be the remedy for that? It's a discussion, you know, and we're, we're meeting with the, the cities here in a little bit, actually within the hour, and um, trying to work out a compromise on, on what we can do. We're trying to bring light to the issue. Um, because if the goal is home ownership, the American dream, you know, what can we do to get people into that American dream? Um, you know, we have about 30% of the families that don't live in a home, don't own a home. And, and we look at all the differences between um, people that rent versus people that own. And, and there's a whole bunch of benefits that go along with home ownership. And it, from living longer um, to, you know, what equity they have. And if you look, I think the latest study showed a, a, the average renter had about $5,600 in assets, where a homeowner average was 230000 and that was a national number, mm -hmm. but uh, huge disparity. It builds wealth. Yeah, it builds wealth. Uh, you mentioned in the press conference how zoning has changed over the years. Now there tend to be developments as opposed to you know individual homes. Um, and, and criteria in those developments, that can drive up costs, like lot size or number of garage stalls or stone facades. How does this get changed? Well, when, when we were growing up, most of the cities had a zoning map and it had R1, R2, R3, commercial, mixed use, industrial, et cetera. Um, and they're still on the maps, but they're normally over the existing structures. And, and kind of what the cities have done is really push everything into a PUD or plan unit development. And the plan unit development has a lot of positives to it. It gives the builder some flexibility to, to put some stuff on. So what we're trying to do is encourage all cities to have pockets of high density zoning where someone can come in and build affordable housing for, you can call it workforce housing, you can call it affordable housing. So these are organic, low, um, or high density, smaller buildings, usually smaller garages. Um, so that, that's the whole idea, is how, how do we bring the two sides together to try to work on that. Just quickly before we go, Governor Walls has requested $276 million in his bonding proposal for affordable housing, preserving existing residences and building new homes. Do you, are you supportive of some bonding money going to alleviate this problem? Yeah, when we look at housing, there, there's a lot of different issues with housing and, and we wanted to attack the home ownership side because we think that's the side that gets talked about the least. Uh, so you have homelessness, you, you have um, senior housing, workforce housing, etc. Uh, the housing bonds play an important part of that. Uh, part of the issue we're hearing from the nonprofits is um, some of the labor struggles that they have in, in finding enough people to work and bid on their projects. 
Senator Draham, I'm sure there's going to be more on this topic yeah. in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. After quick legislative action this week, Governor Walls signed into law a bill providing nearly $21 million in funding for the state's response to the COVID-19 outbreak. I'm just proud of the bipartisan work and the leadership shown by the folks who are here with me. Um, the safety and security of Minnesota citizens is a top priority in this building and in uh, Minnesota government. There is absolutely no daylight between us around those responsibilities. This allows for funds to go directly to Minnesota Department of Health. Um, doing everything we can to make sure that we're following the protocols to contain uh, spread of COVID-19 uh, with the assumption that there will, there will more than likely and probably be more cases start to come up very quickly. This has been the pattern elsewhere. It is quite likely that we will see community spread in Minnesota at some point. So these resources are so essential to get out to local public health, the healthcare coalitions around the state, and the um, epidemiologists, research scientists, and laboratorians at the State Department of Health who are really going to be on the front lines of helping to identify the patterns and to work with us on, on not only individual and close contact containment strategies, but community uh, strategies as well. A few days later, Governor Walls released his supplemental budget, which leaves $1.2 billion on the bottom line. Minnesotans know preparing for those unexpected things in life is the right thing to do. Having plans in place and resources ready and stocked is the right thing to do. That's why my number one priority of the 2020 supplemental budget proposal is to maintain our state's rainy day accounts, savings accounts, and keeping money on the bottom line. From there, our budget addresses emergency responses and critical preparedness for our state's needs. Under current Minnesota law, 16 and 17 year olds can get married with parental permission and judicial consent. A bill to ban marriage before the age of 18 and require proof of age passed the House last session. The Senate's author, Senator Sandy Pappas, now joins me. Thanks for being here. You're welcome. Happy to be here. Thanks. Uh, only two states, New Jersey and Delaware, <laughs> currently have an outright ban on marriage before the age of 18. Why should Minnesota become the third state? Well, Minnesota has always prided itself as being ahead of the curve. So I think when you have legislators that recognize that this is a real problem, um, child marriage, that why not move forward? And as you mentioned, the House passed it last year, but you didn't mention the House passed it unanimously last year. Yes, um, and so if the Senate were to pass it, then mm -hmm. it would presumably go to the governor's desk. That's right. Uh, do you know, is there a path for that bill yet this session? Oh, of course. Um, I'm on the list to bring it up on the floor of the Senate. And as you mentioned, it would go to the governor. The governor has given every indication he'll sign it and it would be, become effective August 1st. Now, just some history, how widespread is the practice of 16 and 17 year olds getting married here in Minnesota? Well, unfortunately, our, um, our Bureau of Statistics hasn't kept track. You'd have to go back county by county and go through the data because they do give their birth date when they get married. Um, but we have some information from the census that we have about 1,200 um, children in Minnesota, or young women in Minnesota and men, who were married at, at uh, underage, under 18. And you, you mentioned young men. Mm -hmm. I think we often assume that this is young women who are getting married, but there are also young men who are getting married before the age of 18. What are some of the reasons that people are getting married before they can rent an apartment or mm -hmm. vote or even buy a pack mm -hmm. of cigarettes? They're not legal, they can't sign a contract. Uh, if they get married, they can't get divorced. They can't go into a battered woman's shelter. There are a lot of reasons, there are a lot of difficulties for child marriage. Plus, getting pregnant at that young age, uh, there are health issues involved. You're more likely to have a premature birth or a baby with problems or impacted labor. So there's a lot of health reasons also why it's not a good idea for young people to get married. We're concerned that there could be untoward pressure, uh, probably from parents um, that are pushing a, a child to get married. When I was growing up, it was not unheard of for high schoolers to get married if there was a baby on the way. Mm -hmm. Back in my day, that was considered the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So should there be an exception for religious or cultural reasons under these circumstances? Absolutely not. And most, most religions and cultures are behind the idea of 18 as being the proper age for marriage. 
if a young girl gets pregnant, there's a much less stigma than there was during when we were younger, you and me. Um, so she could still, um, she could still stay at home. She could still stay in school. She can get help with childcare. To force her out to start her own household is only going to mean poverty in the future, because she doesn't have a high school, um, high school diploma, and the divorce rate is twice as high for for child marriages. So it's better to stay home, have the baby if you wish, and if they're still in love when they're 18, her and the baby's father, they can get married. Now, in the press conference, uh, one of the <clears throat> One of the stories that was told was, um, and, and I've read this in multiple places, sometimes this is happening because a young girl has had intimate relations with a man who's older, mm -hmm. and therefore it's statutory rape unless he marries her. And this mm -hmm. is a way to stop right. that. Right. Is, how widespread do you think that is? Well, enough that we hear about it. I don't know that it's super widespread. It ha he has to also be in a position of authority in order for it to be statutory rape. So that also narrows the window. But why should we have a law that allows it? Even if it's only one or two um, children a year, we still should not allow it. Is this interfering in any way with parental rights? Because we're talking about minor children who mm -hmm. really don't have any rights. And whether or not she's pregnant, her parents, for any number of reasons, may believe that this is the right thing to do. Now, you right. said often the girl may feel pressured. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and when you were a child, you would be, you would feel the pressure of wanting to please your parents. Right. But does this interfere with parental rights? Well, that's why even a provision like California has, which says that a judge has to take her into a separate room and talk to her about whether she's being pressured or not, but she still has to go back and face her parents. So I, I don't think that's really going to be very effective to see if it's really an independent choice. And um, frankly, you could call it child abuse. Um, parents should not be pushing their children into a relationship when they're too mature to really handle it. The American Civil Li Liberties Union of California argued that banning marriage before 18, quote, unnecessarily and unduly intrudes on the fundamental rights of marriage. Uh, the Children's Law Center of California worries <clears throat> that raising the age would prevent minors from leaving the foster care system through emancipation. Apparently in California, this is a way of getting out of the foster care system. Does this apply in any way to Minnesota in your view? Well, there's really two issues. Um, the first issue was whether it um, infringes on constitutional rights to marriage. States can set their laws as they will in terms of marriage. And uh, many states have set it at 18 or 16 or 17 or whatever. And even if they've been set at 12, no one has ever interfered with that. So I think we do have a right as a state to set our minimum marriage age. The question about the foster care system, it's, is it really like jumping from the frying pan into the fire? Do you want to remove yourself from a, a difficult foster care situation into a difficult marriage where there could be abuse, where you don't finish high school, where you're stuck in poverty, where you maybe get pregnant before you you're, should be for your health or your, both your emotional, mental, and physical health? Um, I think it, if we do have an emancipation process in Minnesota, and it might be just better for a child to use that process rather than jump into marriage. You <clears> mentioned <throat> that this passed unanimously in the House. Mm -hmm. Do you expect similar support in the Minnesota Senate? I, I do. I'm very hopeful that we'll have it. It has bipartisan support. And any time people have raised objection, it tends to be things like, why should we interfere with a Romeo-Juliet romance? Well, how'd that turn out? Not so good. Read the play, watch the movie, they're dead at the end, um, in case you didn't remember that. That's not such a good idea. And um, there, it is true in the ethnic communities, there are sometimes cultural marriages, but we really need to encourage them to have legal marriage at legal age, because then both parties have a certain amount of legal rights. They have child custody rights, they have child uh, support rights. They, have, they can get divorced if they need to. They can get into a battered woman's shelter if they need to. So making the legal age um, 18 is really best for everyone. Senator Pappas, I want to thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Senator Roger Chamberlain is promoting legislation to legalize sports betting and to allow student athletes to be paid for their name, image, and likeness. He joins me now to talk about both measures. Thanks for being here. Good to be back. Thank you. Good morning. Let's start with sports betting. You introduced this bill last session, but you've made some changes since then. What's different? 
Well, a lot, a lot of it's technical stuff, but there were uh, one, two primary changes. Uh, maybe we'll get to it later. One change is that we're not including mobile in this one. And secondly, we are going to say that they had to go into the, uh, well, the second one becomes moot if the first one isn't there, right? You'd have to go into, if you have mobile, you go into the casino and, uh, and uh, uh, open an account. I should back up. We do include mobile, and we change to say that you have to go into the casino to to open an account to use your mobile. That's a couple things. Part of it's accommodating the tribes and others. You want people in your place of business. And secondly, it's also easier to verify age and and uh, whether someone's got the legal right to gamble. Place bets. So if I wanted to do some sports betting, initially mm -hmm. I would have to go to a casino or some place like that to set up my account, yes. verify my age, right. all of that stuff. Yep. Right. And then at that point, could I use my mobile? Right. Okay, right. so this and is just that initial step. Right, and then that would be geofenced to Minnesota. So you could use your mobile and they know where you're at, and you can only do it from within Minnesota at Minnesota casinos. You could not do it from Wisconsin or Dakotas or Iowa. It had to be inside Minnesota. Now, when we talked about this before, you did not have the support of the 11 um, tribes in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. You mentioned them in this answer. Does, is, are they more amenable if people have to go in in order to set up accounts? I think they are more amenable. Um, none of the 11 tribes are necessarily for it yet. I continue and we continue to say that this will enhance their business model. It will improve it. It won't harm it. We're there to protect. But... Um, they are not, none of them have come out and said we now support it, but that's the basis of the negotiations. You don't give up your position until you absolutely have to. But they're amenable, and I believe eventually we'll get there. But, you know, it's frustrating. I mean, they don't need tribal support to pass a bill. But they are an interested party, and, and are. you are trying to accommodate them. Sure. According to one testifier, uh, Minnesota would be among a minority of states in allowing sports betting at age 18. The majority of other states are age 21. Considering your views on social media addiction and the preponderance of youth and gaming, mm -hmm. are you concerned that being able to do sports betting at age 18 could lead to problems for that demographic in particular? Well, first, you know, bills and especially bills that are this complex and deal with a lot of different issues their initial offers you go in and as you go through the process and this bill will go to half the committees and the and the senate and the house you find these issues you make changes and make fixes some of our oversights so yeah i mean 21 is fine that's not a that's not a hard and fast rule we can go to 21 easy enough that's not something that we're against in any way but 18 is just the starting point. You can join the military and get your head blown off at 18, So, but you can't smoke, can't drink, and you're not supposed to gamble. But, you know, do everything else, sign a contract and anything okay. else. It's, it's, an odd, it's just the world we live in. So you mentioned also that one of the reasons for legalizing sports betting is to defund the underground economy it's, and then provide consumer mm -hmm. protection. Mm -hmm. Why is, how, how much gambling is really going on? The estimate in the state of Minnesota is uh, roughly a little over a million people maybe engaging in some sort of sports betting. I know people personally that do it, and it could be around two and a half billion dollars, give or take. So, uh, so that's about how much sports betting is going on. And people are concerned about expanding gambling. That's one of the issues: expansion of gambling. It's a bad thing. It's terrible for people. Is it? On the scale of zero to negative and zero to positive, is it something that's going to save lives, uh, benefit society? I'd say around zero to, to point 0.5 or point minus 0.5, really small. But it's something that is people enjoy doing, engaging in, expressing opinions, taking part in that, enjoying sports and enjoying the uh, wagering on sports. But um, it is a, I'm sorry, What's your original question? Again? Oh, it was just it was just to get you to talk about why it's important. But let's let's oh, take sure. this moment then to move on to paying college athletes. Uh, we talked about this last summer. Now there's a bill in both the House and the Senate has mm -hmm. bipartisan support. Um, why is it time for college athletes to be able to be paid for their name, image, and likeness? Because they because everybody else is getting rich. 
Now, I'm going to make clear from the outset is that this is not the college, university, or NCAA paying the athletes. This is a, these are athletes who might get some endorsement money from third parties. The endorsement money could come directly from a Nike or a local auto dealership, whatever the case might be. Or it could be situations where they go on YouTube and do anything. Maybe they're not even doing anything with, regarding sports, and they have enough traffic, they start to make money from that. Everybody knows how YouTube works. Or the, somebody uses their name, like, likeness, and image to sell video games. So it, it runs the whole spectrum. There's a lot of things here. Everybody else is getting rich. These are the only people who aren't allowed to make money for their labor and talent. It's college musicians and college uh, 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 journalists could go out and make all kinds of money on the side. And they, got, they have scholarships. But the college athlete who's making a ton of dough for the university is not supposed to do that. So um, it's right. You have to be paid for what you do. This is fundamentally basic human right and idea of, of our system of, uh, in the society. Now, maybe this wouldn't happen. Maybe it would happen. But there could potentially be a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say Gophers star football player, Gophers mm -hmm. play in TCF Bank Stadium. U.S. Bank wants, the, wants to pay them mm -hmm. to endorse U.S. Bank. Are you worried about any, any kind of conflicts like that arising? I'm not. That's not. Our role is to, to open up and create the opportunity and knock down that barrier and create the opportunity. Uh, the legal system and the, third, and the parties involved will work that out. And I think it would be worked out just fine. We deal with much more complex things out in the real world right now. That's not a concern. If those things pop up, that's for the market and for the athlete and the agent and the college, university, institution to work out. So there's some uh, <clears throat> movement at the federal level. The NCAA has asked the feds to step in because, as you know, California was the first to do this. Now about 20 other states mm -hmm. are considering this legislation. Mm -hmm. um, would this benefit most of all from federal legislation so that all states are equal? Should we wait for that or should Minnesota go ahead? First of all, we should not wait for it because God knows when it would get done up there. Uh, secondly, states can act on their own. Thirdly, I don't trust the NCAA and I certainly don't trust the federal government to, uh, to uh, get this done and get it done quickly and get it done right. Our, the effective date of our, the le effective date of the California legislation is 2023. We even went one year further than that to say because not only does it give time for everybody to work things out, but also um, we can ride California's coattails with that momentum as they go through it. Um, so we have a long, uh, it's three, four years before we become effective. A lot of things will be take, take place and get, get done. And if that's the case, great, then we don't need the bill. Senator Chamberlain, thank you. Thank you very much. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.